All right. Good afternoon, everyone. Come on, let me hear somebody respond back to me. Good afternoon. Okay. Madam Clerk, for our school board, could you do a roll call, please? Yes. Uh, Mr. Cole? Yeah. Here. All right, I think we have something here. Um, if I could just say, I concur totally with you, um, President Coleman, um, Chair Coleman. Um, the only way that the city is gonna move forward is if we come together and we begin to work together so that our children can be educated. Um, and that's, it's, it's not a whole lot to it, that's just it. Um, we have to find ways, we have to figure it out. Um, we're all adults. We all have had things in our lives that we just have to figure out. And, and this is one of them. We have to come together and I'm glad that we have um, the school board that has asked us to come. I'm glad we have counsel and a uh, whole lot of counsel that, that are here. Um, because it's, it's what we want to do. We want to work together to find a solution to what we can do so that our children can have the best that they can have and the city can move forward. And so thank you. I appreciate the invitation. Um, and I thank council because council is here and they're ready so that we can, we can work together and figure it all out. So thank everyone for coming. I appreciate it. All right, at this point, because um, I have the microphone, our next item is to receive a facilities task force and a facilities report from Mr. Tommy Cranes. the needs of the district on its facilities standpoint. The 
first thing that we talk about is capacity. Right now, when we do our capacity, there's actually three ways to measure the capacity inside of a building. You have what we call the RPS functional number, the RPS maximum number, and then you have the state maximum number. And you can see the computations that take place are a function off of the number of students that are in a classroom with the pre-K 15 to 1, kindergarten 18 to 1, 1 through 12 to 22 to 1, and our exceptional education program at 9 to 1. Changing the building has a significant impact on the capacity that's there. It's not a static number. For example, if a pre-K program changes, so the number of classrooms in a building increases in pre-K, that reduces the overall capacity of that building. By the same token, if I were to use the state maximum number for, K, for first through fourth, fifth grade, it allows 35 children per classroom. Now that's not something that we use or what's something we would shoot for, but you can see based off of the measurement that I use, I can come up to a lot of different numbers on what's the capacity inside of a building. From our standpoint, we use the RPS function. We shoot for it to be 85 to 90% of that number because that gives the district the greatest flexibility in meeting the program needs for that building and as they change. When you look at, and this is an actual school, there's 278 students inside that building on October 3rd. You can see the enrollment by grade. Off of that enrollment, we project, just like the state does, by what the capacity or how many classrooms that they need. And you can see the total reflects that that particular school needs 16 classrooms on a functional basis. When I do the same calculation, on an RPS maximum basis, it says it can only have it only needs 14 classrooms. Those two additional classrooms is the equivalent of 44 additional students. If I use the state maximum, that's the equivalent of 70 students. So you can see the point is when we start throwing around a lot of capacity numbers, they're just that. They're a mathematical computation. And they're all right. It really depends on the program and what the building's being used for. And we have to be very careful on how we use these numbers because it will change. Here's a schedule that reflects the empty seats for this year with the element the total on the functional is 5,190 empty seats. Elementary is at 1,200, middle, and you can go down the list. So at first glance, it appears that in the elementary school, there's plenty of seats. Now the fallacy with that is twofold. One, when we look at the projections over the next 10 years, and 10 years is a relatively short period of time from a facility standpoint, our elementary count goes from 1,200 empty seats down to 748 in five years. And then we bounce back up. And you can see the impact with middle from 1100 to 498, the high school from 1430 to 952, and the specialty schools holds its 1300 empty seats. Now, at first blush, we all would say that the district has plenty of seats. And on a pure mathematical basis, you're correct. But the seats don't match where the students are. And the seats do not match where the needs are. And that becomes the huge challenge. Since 2005, the school board and the city council have actually closed 17 schools. That's the equivalent of 1 million square feet of space, 6,600 seats. In that time, four new schools have been opened with a square footage of 575,000 square feet, or 3,700 seats. So the net reduction during that time period has been 425,000 square feet, about 2,900 seats. And that's about 10% of both capacity and about 10% of the total square footage of the district. So since 2005, a lot has been done by both the school board and the city council to address the overcapacity that the Richmond Public Schools has had. Now, so we've addressed the capacity. 
Now let's say, let's make all the schools equal. And I think we all would agree, our schools today are not all equal. We have four schools that were built in 1998. There's 44 operating schools. We have four schools that are brand new. So 36 of the 44 are old. That's 82% of the district's portfolio is over 20 years old. Now, of the 44, one third are over 70 years old. School buildings aren't designed, nor were they built, to go that long period of time. And of the 44, another third are over 50 years old. So two thirds of the school's portfolio exceeds 50 years of age. Now, if we were to go make everything equal, which is what everybody wants, we've laid it out by building, by school, and what we have found that 23 of the 44 buildings need either a complete renovation and or a replacement or a major renovation. And y'all have heard in the facilities report a huge number to make everything equal. Some buildings can be made more equal than others because not all of our buildings have the same size footprints. So not every building can have all the same amenities as every other building. But if we were to make them as equal as possible, it would take some major significant dollars to do that. On an equalization basis, we do not believe that in the long term, it can be done very quickly, even if we were to have even if we were to have, oh, that's better. Even, <laughs> even if a check was given, it's about $645 million. And $645 million can't be spent overnight. $645 million couldn't be spent real quick over 15 years. It would take time to do that. It's not a viable watch for a lot of reasons. One, the costs are extremely large larger than anybody can absorb. Two, there would need to be some major rezoning that would have to take place. And that's something that will have to be done long term anyway to meet the needs. Three, you've got the additional costs needed to address the capacity issues. And there's some real capacity issues that are going to arise on September 8th of 2015. They're here. It's not, not oh maybe, on September 8, 2015, and we'll talk about it, you're going to see the impact of where the capacity is taking place. And then lastly, if we equalize all the buildings, there is no operational efficiencies achieved. And we've shown by the empty seats that we have that there is the need to eliminate seats and save money and generate the efficiencies. The problem is is where the empty seats are or not where the students are. And there's a real disconnect. This is a graph that shows the total capacity of the district, which is 27,673 seats. And this doesn't count pre-K centers. This is just the 44 main schools. And you can see our enrollment goes from 22,004 to 23,008 over the next 10 years. So again, graphically it shows we've got plenty of capacity and we should be fine. And let's break that down by school type. On an elementary basis, we have 13,006. And right now, based off of that 10-year projection, there appears to be plenty enough seats to handle, over the next 10 years, the elementary students. However, and I'll graph this out in a second, right here is a, a map that shows all of the schools, and y'all are getting this via email, uh, so you'll have the color map. But the darker shades represents from Mumford and Fox North and south of the river Broad Rock, that those schools are currently at 100% of their RPS functional number. The ones that are a little bit slightly less colored are between 95 and 100%. So of the 25 elementary schools that are on this map, Right now, today, there's 10 of them that are at 85% or higher, 
And there's nine of them that have serious issues when we look at their projection growth over the next 10 years. When we look just at the south of the river numbers, right there shows south of the river, we don't have enough seats. In south of the river, there's 12 elementary schools. And of those 12 elementary schools, seven make up the bulk that are exceeding their seats. So the answer becomes, let's just rezone. That seems to be the simplest solution. However, when you look, and I'm sorry I don't have a, there we go. Broad Rock, Oak Grove, and Green, and Reed are all right at about 100%. With Francis sitting at 88, Miles Jones at 92, and Westover sitting at about 95%. That's where the growth is. Now, the schools that are free are Fisher, Southampton, Red, Swansboro, and Blackwell. Now, in 10 years, this is what the map looks like. Fisher's at 70%, Southampton's at 72%. Their enrollment's not growing. Their enrollment's actually starting to go backwards. <coughs> Westover Hills is sitting at 102%. Blackwell's at 57 and you can see this is the growth again, those seven schools. So now let's rezone out, right? However, where am I going to take Broad Rock, Francis, and Green to get to Fisher and Southampton and Blackwell? Now I'm going to move schools and buses and students past not just their existing school, but also neighboring schools. So when we talk, you hear me say, <clears throat> let's reshuffle the deck. Yeah, I can reshuffle the deck. But now, when we reshuffle the deck, this student at Broad Rock may be going to a school, Ginner Park, up north of the river. It doesn't flow real equally. And that's what I mean by where the needs of the district is and where the assets are located don't match. That's why it's not a simple solution to the facility issue. And of course, the moment we take students and move past not just their zone school, but also their neighboring school, is when you hear the citizens in an uproar. So it's not just, let's reshuffle the deck. Rezoning is a tool, and rezoning is one that can solve some of our problems, but rezoning by itself can't solve all of it. It's not there. And you'll see more of that when we get into middle school. North of the river, look at that. 5,900, and we actually decreased to 5,800. And in totality, north of the river is at 84% of their utilization factor. And it'll have capacity over the next 10 years. There's only two schools, Mumford and Fox and Holton, that today are close with Mumford and Fox over 100%, and Holton right at 100%. In 10 years, there's only two, Mumford and Fox. So, when I start to reshuffle that deck, Fox and Mumford aren't available because they're already at capacity. So now I'm going to be taking students that are from a Reed, a Francis, a Green, a Broad Rock, and you can see bringing them far distances if I'm going to try to reshuffle the deck. The whole growth that's projected to take place is south of the river. It's not north. And south of the river, come September 8th, is 200 new elementary students. Those 200 new elementary students are here and here. That's where 150 of those 200 students are projected to be come the fall. Broad Rock and Green. Broad Rock today has 827 students in a building built for 650. Green has 550 students in a building built for 394. Come September 8th, there will be portables at both sides. And there's no way around it. There's no way around it. 
There's no solution that will take place between now and the end. And the portables that will be at Broad Rock are in their front yard because that's the only vacant land at Broad Rock. And that's 2016. In 2017, there's another 200 students projected to hit the door. Broad Rock's got about 70 of those 200. So our problem's not going away. It's only going to get worse. We look at our middle schools. Our middle schools are showing growth from 4,300 to 49. That growth is south of the river. It's not north. It's exactly what we've seen in the elementary school. You can see, look what happens. Come fiscal year 2020, we start exceeding the capacity and we continue to take off. That right there is Elkhart. That growth is Elkhart with a little bit of it being Bouchard. And that's coming. You can look today, the map, you don't see anybody that's really dark. There's all capacity, and there is. Elkhart had 490 students in a building that can house about 600. Thompson's 450 students in a building that can house about 1,200. Brown sits in a building with 790 students that can house 850. Bouchal has 600 students in a building that houses over 800. There's capacity there today. But if our projections are right, in 10 years, look what happens. Bouchal and Elkhart under their existing scenario, are both in excess of 100% significantly. That ties to what we've seen with our projections for the elementary schools. <coughs> Elkhart and Thompson combined on their very first day will have a thousand students. On their first day, they'll have a thousand students. In three years, they'll have over 1,200 students and continuing to grow. And there is no place. If we rebuild Elkhart <clears throat> to its existing capacity, in three years we exceed it. And to rebuild it, where I make it whole, what it was, is nine and a half million dollars. In 24 months to do it. If we renovated it, it's 23 million dollars and made it equal. But the renovation doesn't include any additions. All the renovation did was bring it back to an equal state. We still have that capacity. And we would say initially, let's go to Bouchal, but Bouchal's not a viable option because Bouchal's going to grow. North of the river, you can see 1900, and we, start, we got some growth to about 2100, but we have capacity north of the river with our middle school. MLK, and you'll see on the 10 years, is pretty much at 100%. Albert Hill sits at 100%. Henderson and Benford are slightly below their numbers. Benford, you've seen the, re the change of the program change there at Benford that was instituted by our board a number of months ago. The first year of that will kick off this school year. It's exciting, the numbers that have come in. But time will tell if it's going to be successful in attracting the new middle school students that the district wants to achieve. But preliminary indications are that it will be. In 10 years, MLK stays there. Hill actually grows and gets a little bit over 100%. High schools, 6,300 capacity, 4,900 today. will grow it to about 5,400. But that growth is south of the river. Here you can see we go from 2,300 2, up to 2,800, and that growth all takes place. Here's Huguenot at 100%, here's Whip, and then there's a patch here that's Armstrong. In 10 years, Huguenot stays over 100, Whip gets over 100, and Armstrong P stays relatively flat. The growth is occurring right in this area.
Everything points to that. North of that river, you can see we're at 2,600. We'll stay at 2,600 in 10 years. So what are the options? How do we address the facility issue? A blank check's not the answer. And a check, even if one could do the check, that's not, not going to solve all the problems tomorrow. It's not going to happen. can happen. So we look, what were the options that were available to the board? Well, first off, we listed the tools that the board could address. And we laid out those tools based off of the simple to the complex and the ones that had no cost to the ones that cost money. And you can see the first one is capacity programs. It's the very first thing we talked about today in the presentation. The capacity is tied to the programs. You got room use and you can go down the list. We took those tools and laid out what we think were viable potential options that the board could consider. And we came up with five of them as part of the facility staff. The first one says there's really no change. There's no new schools, there's no major renovations, and really there's no rezoning. Under that scenario, we continue to have old buildings and our systems remain antiquated as they are today. Our CIP is going to continue to be high because the needs to replace equipment and systems is going to be huge. We continue to band-aid it, it's not going to go away. At some point, we're going to have a disaster. We're going to have higher operating costs because nobody's not generated any efficiencies through consolidations. We're going to have portables. The new students are coming. I may not want the new students to come, believe me, I know. Be a lot of sleepless nights between now and the eighth. But they are coming. And we have to have a place to house those students. In our opinion, from an administration standpoint of the task force, option one is not a viable option. It's an option. But we don't believe that that's an option that's worth considering. Option two basically is a rezoning process. It's going to use rezoning to fix the problem. What that will do, if we try to rezone out of our problem, it will have a significant impact on communities and schools. Because when we rezone, we rezone every single school. Nobody gets left out of the equation. The problem's too big, and the number of seats needed are too large. So everybody gets impacted by a rezone. You'll see a significant increase in operating costs because transportation will soar. We'll be bringing students, we already bring a large number of miles, we'll be going even further distances with greater time constraints. The number of buses will increase. It will have a significant impact on operating costs. It's going to impact the quality of education. Right now, today, there's certain days we run 30 drivers short. That means 120 routes out of 464 in the morning and 120 out of 486 in the afternoon are doubled up. Those students get to school late. They get home late. And in many cases, we get to pick them up late from school. It has an impact on the quality of education. We continue under this option with old buildings and systems. We continue to have high operating costs. We continue to have high CIP amounts. And we're still going to have portables to address the capacity issue. There's no way around it. In the administration's opinion, that's not a viable option. Option three says let's equalize the schools. We've talked about that. We don't believe equalization by itself is a viable option as well because it's still the number one thing it doesn't do. There's two things it doesn't do. One, it doesn't address capacity. And two, it doesn't create any efficiencies. So the operating costs are going to continue to be high. There's not going to be any change to the cost per pupil we have today. If all we did is equalize all the buildings, that will not lower operating costs because we have the same amount of square footage, 
we have the same amount of empty seats, we're going to continue to have the same high operating costs. If we're going to, and it's very expensive, we've talked about that. Option four is what I call the shock trip. Option four lowers the cost. If we want to get out of this as just efficiencies and we want to lower our operating costs, we can do it. And we can do it very quickly. All I need is the go and then protection from everybody that's going to be looking for me. Okay? But it's doable. It's very doable. So let me make that unequivocally clear. It's very, very doable, but it's going to be very difficult to implement. Under this option, we establish pre-K centers for all our pre-K programs. We rezone all the elementary schools. We consolidate four existing elementary schools into two. We consolidate another elementary school with a small addition. We consolidate two middle schools into an existing location. We consolidate one of our five comprehensive high schools. We consolidate four of our secondary schools into two existing locations. We move to a full-time CTE center. Remember I said all of these we could do very quickly. You told me, Tommy, my board, and, and the superintendent said, Tommy, we want this implemented by September of 2016. Piece of cake. But what this doesn't address is new students. Doesn't address the capacity issue, and they're coming. So we can get to, we can solve the problem and do a lot of efficiencies today, but in three years, and not just in three years, in, in September of this year, when those 12 portables and a portable dining room goes up in front of Broad Rock, it's going to, you're going to see what I'm talking about, how the capacity is such a big issue in this equation. That same issue is going to occur in three years if Thompson and Elkhart remain where they're at. And there's no easy place to put portables at Thompson. I've looked. Oh, i got some ideas and I'll keep them to my best. But if you think Broad Rock is an issue, wait till you see where I'll put the portables at Thompson. So I can do it. But I don't think that's the best, we as administration don't believe that's the best option. The option that we believe in is option number five. Option five is a combination of everything. It's a combination of rezoning, it's a combination of the consolidations, and it's a combination of new schools, renovations, and additions. So in this, we take everything that was in the plan, and you can see it, it flows pretty much with four, and I'm just going to fly through this because there's another slide that will sum this up pretty well. This right here represents the cost to do it over 15 years. If we implemented, if we implemented option number five over the next 15 years, that's the cost right there. That took the $18 million that was, um, I know has not been adopted yet officially, and used that just as we discussed in the council during the budget workshop and laid out year by year, project by project, it's an option five by year. What that does is this. In phase one, and I laid it out, phases are five year increments. In the first year, first five year period, four elementary schools would be closed, two new elementary schools would be built, and one would have an addition. So if it had an addition, it doesn't impact the total number of buildings. That's why it's only a net two. 
reduction of two. In phase two, five are closed, and I made a typo there. Two are open new, and that should have been minus three. And then in phase three, we have one being added. In total, we have nine elementary schools that would be closed, five new ones open, and two would have additions, so a net reduction of four. The middle over this time period, three would be closed, one new, net of two. High school, we close two, we open one, a net of one. The total, 14 schools are closed, seven new ones are added, the two elementary additions for a net of seven. That's what option five would do. So we went from the 17 buildings that's been closed since 2005 with the addition of four, so a net of 13. And this program would increase that net 13 to a net of 20. Okay? What are our issues? Seven of the 12 elementary schools south of the river got significant growth. It's coming. The middle school is going to grow, all signs point to it, in the next three years. A new elementary school is 18 months from design to final constructions completed. A new middle school is 24 months from design to the final construction complete. If we rezone schools, which we would, it's an integral part of the plan, we can't open schools in the middle of a school year. So we're opening schools at the beginning of a school year. And that's critical to remember because the timing of getting things started will impact whether it can be used in a year or two years or three or four, depending on, it may be available six months before the opening day. But because of the rezone, it's not practical to assume we're gonna open it mid-year. Eighty-two percent of our buildings are old, they're going to continue to get old. Right now, today, there's three buildings, two comprehensive high schools in an existing building whose mechanical systems are on their last leg. If one of those go, I have no place to move those people to. If one of those large comprehensive schools, that system fails, it's what worries us every night. It worries us every moment we wake up. If it closes, we're going to have to drastically change the way we educate the students in the high school because there is no fallback. And it will happen. I'm not the Downing Thomas. I know that's my name. Okay? If you would see the things, some of the things, you would understand what I'm talking about. 23 of the 44 schools you saw needed major renovations or complete renovations slash replacement. That's going to continue to be the case. They're going to continue to get older. I appreciate and want to thank y'all for everything you've done this year. I know you have a tough, tough budget. Um, and I appreciate that. I'll take every penny I can get. But understand the challenges because y'all as the elected officials have the difficult choice to make. And I believe that my job is to give you the best information possible so then you can make the best informed decision. So with that said, I'm open to any questions you may have.
so that not only can the city be responsive to and, and also engage our staff that does uh, work projections uh, that we use those numbers to, to uh, measure a lot of um, um, economic indicators and other um, service needs uh, for the city. Um, and so it would be good to have a better appreciation for the, the methodology The basic methodology we use is we bring in a doctor, demographer, who um, did the same analysis for the district back in 2002 and 2007. The data he uses is you want to know how many childbearing women are going to be at a given point in time in order to compute how many students will be there at that given point in time. Now, when this was done in 2002 and 2007, what the computation said is that if you wanted to maintain your enrollment, if the district wanted to maintain its enrollment flat, it needed 2.1 births per childbearing lady. It was running 1.9. So there was a negative gap off the bat. And that, that kind of tied to what you saw, that declining enrollment. The second thing that impacts it is we see a migration of students in particularly elementary going to middle that there's, and, and it's tied to the families that are leaving the Richmond area and we're not seeing as many coming back into the Richmond area, okay? And that had a negative impact. When we did the current projections, we took the 2010 census as well as a database from the Internal Revenue Service. And through the analysis that was performed, computed what the birth rates were today. And that birth rate today, while it's still 2.1 to remain flat, the birth rate today is 2.8. So we're seeing more young children born into our community, which will give us an increase in the students. The second thing we've seen is that we saw a reduction of the migration, the negative migration. The migration, while it's still negative, it's not anywhere near what we had seen in the previous. The last thing that you want to factor into is where is the development opportunities? Um, and as you've heard me say in earlier presentations, a projection is just that. We have all the best data in the world, and we can refine it if, as fine wants to be. But at the end of the day, it's still a guess, because there are assumptions that have to be made. If certain things, for example, if in the Blackwell area, where there's some reinvestment opportunities because of past practices in the 60s and the 70s, if those neighborhoods were to take off, that would have a negative impact on our projections. While we knew about it, while we factored it in, it's a minor adjustment in our current projections. So if this area took off from an enrollment standpoint, we would have, it would negatively impact our projections for Blackwell, which right now are projected to basically be flat to a slight decrease. Um, so I hope that gives you, we'll gladly hook you up with our demographer and uh, we can go through it in a lot more. But that kind of gives you the 40,000 foot level view of it. Okay, thank you. Um, I would just ask uh, Ms. Luwali if we would follow up with that and also get our economic development uh, folk involved to look at that methodology and any other me methodology that we're doing uh, from a city perspective for um, development zones, uh, high impact development zones, and um, anticipated population growth so that we can look at both uh, sources of data mm -hmm. to see if we are, you know, both operating in a way that we can anticipate this better. Thank you. If I'm not mistaken, it's in tab three is the detail of our development. Thank you, Mr. Cranes. Thank you, um, 
school board and Dr. Bedden for your participation. I, I'm happy that um, this is the first time that we've been able to do this since I've been on city council, so uh, I'm, I'm very encouraged by that. I think one question that I have, and you, you began your presentation with Trans about defining capacity, and there were um, perhaps different definitions. There was the RPS functional, the RPS maximum, and then what is the state definition. Um, when you say RPS maximum capacity, that is based on the square footage of our facilities? It's, it's a function of the square footage plus the program that's actually being run inside that room. Okay. And then the functional capacity is based on a, a preset determination as to what the preferred uh, teaching ratio would be. Yeah, the program would tell us it's a pre-K, kindergarten, you know, what, what grade are they going to use that room for? Uh, we don't see too much from a program until you get into the secondary schools, where you're on science labs and things of that sort. Okay, and then the state level. So when we talk about other school districts, mm -hmm. right, and everybody wants to look elsewhere and say, well, their capacity is X and their capacity is, is Y, are they doing their own local capacity calculations, or do many of them just take the state standards? Well, I haven't talked to other districts here in my prior lives with other districts in other states. Every district does it a little bit differently. The methodology is fairly close, but um, everybody generally, there's some tweaks that, that make it difficult. You got to be careful when you compare yourself to other districts that you're comparing true apples to apples. Sure. So if we bring this back locally, apples to apples, um, the policies that are set forth in terms of the functional capacity that is set for the entire Richmond Public School District. So, um, whereas we have some neighborhoods that have high poverty and their uh, what might be a preferred teacher student ratio might be different than an area that doesn't have the same challenges of those children that live in poverty, but it's the same standard that's being applied to all those schools. We, the, the capacity numbers that we have here is just from a building standpoint. Now, from an academic standpoint, the superintendent and, and, the, and the, the, the academic leadership team um, have to see what they need to do to address those academic challenges inside those buildings. And that will have a negative, that will reduce, it's not going to have a negative, it will reduce the overall capacity inside of the building. Okay. So, so to be in real terms, in the budget for next year, there's a K-3 class size reduction. Mm -hmm. That then would potentially increase the utilization of our buildings because these class sizes would then be reduced and potentially separated into new classrooms? Is this? It would, what that would do is a class lowering the count. So you're going to go from 22 to 1 to 14 to 1. So you're going to have eight fewer students. That's the equivalent, if you have three classes per grade, that's 24 less students. That has an impact on that building capacity. Your total enrollment didn't change. Now all I did is shuffle the deck of the existing classrooms inside that building. So when, when we go to lower pupil-teacher ratios, because they're needed, then that changes that capacity number, and it can change it pretty dramatically. But for this purpose, we've kept everybody at the same. So for the analysis that the task force came up with, that does not account for operationally a reduction in the class size that has just been funded. No, because that we didn't have that information, number okay. one. And number two, <coughs> programs change. Programs will change. And so you got to have a point that you can keep measuring it. So, you know, the, the task force felt like staying at that 22 to 1 from a functional standpoint in consultation with the administration, that that was our best number to use from a facility need standpoint. Okay? But, but the reality is that the utilization is actually going to be going up because of this class size reduction. Well, and next year, next year if, if with the budget and the utilization, we'll be going from 22 to 1 to 14 to 1. 
and that's going to have an impact on the overall capacity inside some of our elementary schools. And we'll have to factor that into the equation. But right now, we're comfortable what we've projected for portable needs in our existing space that we can accommodate what will happen next year. Okay, thank you. Um, you had mentioned in one of the options that um, there was this desire to have more uh, community-centered schools, and that that was one of the reasons why one of the options wouldn't work was if the busing and, and sending people all across the city um, would eliminate this, this sense of a community school. And I guess the question that I would have is there was a statistic in the paper recently about how what percentage of students in Richmond Public Schools are already attending out-of-zone schools. And if that is the number, um, do we have community schools? How would you define a community school if we already have a high percentage of, of students who are uh, attending schools out-of-zone? And then also considering uh, that the city has about 60% of our residents are renters, and the rental population tends to have a higher mobility. And so if I rent here this year, next year I may be in a different part of the city. Um, and how do we then account for this notion of a highly transient population, but our school buildings being fixed? How do you address that? Because we may be trying to solve the, the capacity problems that we see right now based on some growth <coughs> trends but you know, these are projections, and, and it doesn't always mean that our projections are going to end up meeting reality. So I guess my question is, you know, is there, with a, such a high mobile population, is there a better um, matrix to address mobility when we have fixed assets? I'm going to start with the easy part. To your question first is your mobility issue typically what we found is associated with your poverty issue your homelessness issue and all that instability so until some of the socioeconomic challenges are addressed for the clientele that we serve in richmond that mobility is going to be a challenge consistently so that is a external factor that requires a lot of collaboration to address that to stabilize it because people move and come and go because of economic issues that are forces that are being applied to them. Whether it be they can't afford to live in certain jurisdictions, they're evicted because they can't pay the, the you know, so the work opportunity, the income opportunity, all those things are the factors that, that contribute to it. So the absence of those things that the school district can't control independent of any other agency, you still have to design a system. And what Richmond has is a school-based choice option, meaning every student is still given a zoned school. And they create choice, which is like my last district had the same thing. And many urban districts have done that to stave off mass exodus. So the other problem is if you probably had not done your choice option, you may have lost a great population in addition to the students that you already lost prior to the sweep coming back up. So some of that is typically done as a method to stop the flight to the suburbs when you give choice. Uh, in the manner where there's space available to your non-specialty schools. So you, as I understand it coming in, that was one of the emphasis. So Mr. Coleman was probably here then, I don't know if you can speak to that, but that's one of the tools you help to, to decrease the exodus of your school system by like giving them your choice. And I'll give you a prime example. A number of people go to Arrow Hill who don't live in Arrow Hill zone. If they did not get to go to Arrow Hill, they probably would have chosen to go private or move. It was meant to be an intervention to decrease uh, the exodus of students from your, your program. The same thing happened with Brown. You know, Brown was a choice model that was put in place to give some middle school opportunities for students to not, to, to, to choose to stay in the system rather than leaving it. Now, Brown and Thomas Jefferson are whole school models being converted to whole school so that we're serving both choice and the neighborhood kids who are assigned have access to the program. Uh, so we're slowly migrating to, to, to level the playing field because even when you visited, for instance, Brown, as I came in and talked to the students, many of them felt segregated and isolated because it was a program within the school 
that this group of kids went to that program while the rest of the kids had no access to the program. And now we've opened it up because even IB has said we don't offer school within school programs anymore. They only do old school models now because they believe all kids should have access to the rigorous academic program. So that's you know the transition that we're going through. But to, to answer your question about a model to address um, the, the high mobility situation, uh, that's something that would have to be a collaborative conversation with other agencies to create stabilization situation with it, but it continues to be a challenge for us. So we have to build models, I think, that still allow for kids to be guaranteed fate, meaning you have a neighborhood school, because we don't have enough seats where the demand is for kids that want to go. There's always a waiting list for someone who wants to go to another school that they perceive as a better, high-quality school. There's some people, for example, don't want to go to Henderson just because of the design of the school. The old wall concept, which was a fad when it was done, was, in my opinion, a disaster. I would have never recommended building a school that way. Um, and parents really don't like it. So we get a number of parents who want to go to a different school because they don't like that model that, that exists in the design of the school. Sure, I, I think the, the reality is that the city rental population isn't going to ever become a Chesterfield County. We're the inverse of a Chesterfield County, where you have 20%, 30% renters in Chesterfield, we've got 67% renters here in the city. We're, so we can't be saying, well, these are external factors that we can't control, we need somebody else to help change that. I honestly don't think the city is gonna be moving in a direction to get 70% home ownership. I just don't see that as being a reality now, 10 years from now, 60 years from now, 200 years from now. So what we have to do is build a system that works for what we have relative confidence will be the system for the long duration. And I, and I do think um, you know, that we need to be thinking more clearly on that line than thinking that, oh, we're just going to be able to get homeowners in every single neighborhood with every single school and it's going to become um, leave it to beaver. You know, that, that's not kind of the model of enrichment that we're going to ever be seeing. I don't think that's my point of saying, though, that, that those external factors in the school district, even what you're describing, are external to us. And I believe having, I think what you what they did do was try to still make sure every kid had a assigned school and create choice to allow that. Because again, if, if a seat is not available to go somewhere else, you still got to make sure they get fate. So I would say that the hybrid they've done right now was the first step of doing that. Um, because you know, there is limitations to the makeup of the city. There's only, for instance, so many places, I think, to build homes now. Well, so that won't change. And one of the things, I give you north, in the neighborhood I live in, you have a number of people who didn't move. Their kids are gone, but they love their neighborhood, so they stayed. So the kids have aged out of school-age population, but no one has left the neighborhood, so you didn't grow any more school-age population. So that becomes then, a, for lack of a better term, a dead zone for school-aged kids. Even, even when you have homes. You look at the north, right around Holton, that's why Holton is not going to grow a lot. There's not a lot of trouble over there with the homes. So you're going to get that even with the homeowners. If they don't leave, you get new coming in and growth in the population with uh, new per, uh, age-bearing families, and, I mean child-bearing families, you won't get the growth. And right now, only growth that's happening is in the south area now. We can only go by the demographer's projections. Could that flip it sometime? Absolutely. But right now, everything we're seeing is, you know, that north Richmond area, part of that is also just people who love their home and haven't moved. So you don't have any new clientele coming in to replace those that have aged out. The new birth is not replacing the, the ones who transitioned out. Thank you. Mr. Krantz, thank you for this presentation and for the information you provided us during the budget session as well. Dr. Fedden, thank you so much. And school board members, um, I'm particularly appreciative of this opportunity to really roll up our sleeves and talk about how we're going to make the absolute best school system for our kids who are the best and the brightest. Uh, and especially if 
we work to ensure that the curriculum and the facilities that they are in on a daily basis are state of the art. This is, uh, so first question, uh, this isn't really a question, Madam President, so this one won't count. Um, Mr. Pants, <laughs> can we uh, get a copy of the presentation at some point? Yeah, we, we're okay. getting that from our school board office, too. Okay, all right. And this next item is just going to, I'm sure, be uh, redundant rhetorical. You shared uh, the possibility of the major breakdown being imminent in two of our, our high schools. And I'm, uh, I'm, I, I know you have your arms around some measures to mitigate, hopefully, and even possibly prevent those until we can get to that. Dan suggested that, right? Correct. Okay, all right, so that one. Then the real question um, for me, the option five that you presented, which is the option that you're suggesting and recommending that we would proceed with, do we have greater specificity on that option such that we have a sense of dollars, when dollars would be needed, phasing in, uh, those kinds of things. Is that is the option. It's going to take quite a while to get underway. Um, I'd really like to have some opportunity sooner than later to have us uh, be clear about that and then to talk about strategies to make this a reality in our city. Um, yeah. Other communities have been faced with the need to uh, reduce old school systems and we're there and there have been some successful strategies I think we can learn from, but I think the sooner we can get started with that kind of well delineated plan, um, the sooner we can get started with changing what we're looking at. Yes, ma'am. We've got, I mean, we've laid out to do this chart right here. We've taken option five and laid it out by year, by dollar amount, what would be designed, what would actually be during construction. So we have that specificity of how we get it out. Uh, yes, ma'am. Yeah, I, I, I know I've got to, to generate this chart and the one behind it. I have each school. I know uh, their timelines, the marks. But to, to go public today would be appropriate. Number one, our board uh, has not formally adopted one option over the other at this point. Um, but we have laid out option five, school by school, year by year. Yes, ma'am. to work on is really what I would press for. That's all I'm saying. So I'm, I thought it had been adopted, but I'm clear. But as soon as we can get there, I'd like to get to the other there, which is that plan for new construction. So thank you. Thank you, uh, Madam President. Thank you uh, again for this meeting and presentation. Um, Getting back to these projections, I don't want to get too bogged down on this, but I, I will. Um, are we looking at, uh, are we sharing or getting information from our economic development department as to where these housing units are coming online from South Side? I mean, the bulk, the bulk this year of our housing wasn't brand new housing, the growth that took place. I can go into an apartment complex and now I have went from one family to three. I went from two children to ten. Um, we, can, we can show you, um, in particular Broad Rock and in Oak Grove, I mean in Green, it's, it's a few stops is where the bulk of our growth is occurring. Okay. Uh, are those per unit, are you saying? We've seen where a year ago, there was one family in a unit. Today, I may have three families in that same unit. Okay. So there is a, a doubling up versus, mm -hmm. uh, sometimes tripling up versus uh, new housing units. Being. Correct. Uh, so uh, I'm also seeing increased birth rates in, in the north side, which I think is uh, in the Bellevue area, particularly around Old. Uh, so you can have, as you said, the growth within the, the units themselves. 
practice. Okay, well, I'll read you my math because 
I went through the pluses in each school, how much, we, how many more students would be in school mm -hmm. based on this. Mm -hmm. That's how I got it. I got you. Spectrum. Well, I mean, I'll be able to look at the numbers, but, but the high school numbers will go up because with increases. That's how the high school numbers start to take off, is we see that middle school enrollment going into high school and width starts to increase. Um, and in the, in the middle school's count, it's when Bouchard and Elkhart take off that we see both of their, their seats start to drop. Because the other middle schools are running basically flat. So I would expect their seats to drop. But I'll work with you. We'll look okay. at that together. I'll work with you. It just, and I might have done it wrong. It just looks like, that's why I like this plan. Is there for you to try to eliminate those empty seats we have? Yes, ma'am. Uh, you more consolidation, thanks. Uh, just a couple of questions. Um, I was being kind at first. I thought I'd just ask for a little time, but um, my my question um, as a follow up on the option that is recommended um, with the consolidation of schools. There have been some discussion about increasing the size of additional, new, especially new schools that we bring on or additions to schools. Can we go back and visit that where we would actually be building or the recommendation, if the recommendation includes building schools um, significantly larger than schools that we have currently in the system of the, of the option that you're proposing as the, the preferred option of choice. If you, you remember correctly, one of the recommendations we're making as an administration is that we build, and I'm doing this from memory current time, the elementary schools that are at a capacity of a thousand, but when you do uh, the recommended, and this is industry standard, typically 80 to 85 percent um, enrollment, that you'd be hitting about 750 to 800 kids uh, in the school. Uh, the middle schools would go to uh, 1,500, and the high schools at 2,000, which would end up roughly being about 1,600 students uh, in them which is fairly consistent also, uh, which you will see, for instance, uh, again, Norfolk has about 9,000 more students than we do, but they have the same number of buildings, and their schools are, are typically uh, that size. Um, and that's how you're gonna also eliminate the number of buildings you need, so which will reduce the cost, but also be prepared to address the need of your population. Uh, that you're serving. An example we gave when someone may panic and say, oh my God, we're gonna have a thousand student elementary school. And it's how you design the building. So overly simplified concept could be K to two is on the first level, and three, five could be on the second, or you could have, if the land mass allows it, wings or section in the building to separate K two, three, five, and that type of thing. So it's how you design the building that allows it to be that size and still not be Oh my God, it's too big for us to. In uh, our purpose, I believe, Tommy, you factor that into that with what you saw with the closing of the buildings and opening of the new ones wasn't on the premise of those larger design footprints. And so, in essence, you have those already now. Like Broad Rock is one of those large schools already, just the building can't accommodate it. Um, I'm not sure if I'm following you on that. Uh, because um, let me just say, um, uh, elementary school at a thousand students is exceptionally large for the city of Richmond and what Richmond was accustomed to. And as we look at building schools and being uh, competitive, in the metropolitan area because that's where we lose our families to. We're not losing our families outside of the metropolitan area. Um, uh, before we before we get um, absolutely comfortable with that option, I think that it's, it would be valid for us to explore that a lot more and understand how that works so that 
if that is the option that is adopted by the state board. Uh, we know that Richmonders um, are aware of that and they buy into that and they understand that methodology and how the school is built and so forth. So we, we're buying, we're getting the populace to buy into supporting that. Um, the initial reaction that I've gotten from uh, people in, in sharing this conversation has not been favorable, but there's a lack of information and we could perhaps overcome that, but we would be not um, wise to assume that that would be embraced without a significant investment of education in that process that that option would work for us. Um, the, the other question uh, that I have is that um, I think this is a two-pronged conversation that I'm hopeful that we will move um, also to beyond facilities, that we would also move to more clarity and more discussion and explanation as it relates to economic, I mean, academic achievements uh, and what is needed. As you mentioned earlier, when the discussion came up about mobility and poverty in the city, and that's a fact that's outside of schools, um, but it is a responsibility of the city. And one of the things that is extremely important to us in that process is that we look at those other factors and how they weigh in and how they're going to impact uh, schools um, and also the city in the process. So from a per student cost, one of the reasons why we were very mo more successful, if we call it success, in closing several schools is because we paid a lot of attention to the per student cost and its and facilities um, contribution to that cost. Is it realistic for us to anticipate that we would, we could assume if the preferred option is adopted and all factors are agreed upon, um, that we would be shooting for a per student cost uh, and we could project what that per student cost would be that we would hope that this option would get us to? I'll work, with, I'll work with our finance group um, and see what we can do to possibly do it. But I mean, the larger the school, your operating costs will be less. Your construction costs are less. So let me, let me just say, I hear communities that like community schools, and that's great. But the construction is higher when I build two schools. The construction cost for two schools versus one large one is a significant difference. That'll throw all those numbers off the chart. And I, and I understand that and I respect that, uh, but one of the things that I'm not sure that we have invested the time and energy in that we should, um, Richmond has been consistently losing students um, because families are making a, have made a choice previously to not enroll their children in Richmond Public Schools. Um, whereas I'm willing to believe and think that a lot of that may be due to the facilities, I think it's worth the investment for us to do a, to have someone to really do an analysis of why families choose or choose not to put their children in Richmond Public Schools so that, you know, if this factor that I'm raising as it relates to a thousand student capacity is a challenge for people that live in Richmond and they will say, well, you know, I don't want my kids in a thousand. I'm going to move to him right because theirs are still at whatever size it is. Uh, so I think that, you know, those are some of the, that's the additional information that I think that we should invest in is to okay. better understand what is it that may, may families make the choice that they don't want to put their kids in Richard Public Schools and know what those facility answers are, but also know what the other answers are, that we need to be careful that we're making that same level of investment because if we're projecting that based on birth, the potential
potential birth rate growth that all of those or a per percentage of those are going to put their children in richer public schools. We need to understand why, um, what that reason is for people not making that choice and make sure that our investments are being made in a way that they will stay in rich public schools. And, I, and the, uh, the last question I'd like to ask is, um, I, it would be, it would, I would not take, miss this opportunity to say that part of our growth strategy in the city of Richmond has always been to redevelop our public housing community. Uh, Dove Court is, I mean, Blackwell is one of those first public housing community that we went in, we took down public housing, we have not rebuilt the community um, as we had planned to at the, in the time period that we planned. And that is probably part of the reason why Blackwell today, that school, does not have uh, the population that it will have when development picks back up. Um, the same is true with Dove. We went in, we dislocated uh, hundreds of families. We promised them a new community, which included the school. Uh, during the budget process, I recognized that the demand for Southside uh, is a pressing issue, and we moved it out a few years for Dove. However, yeah, I mean, you know, we made a commitment. It's the taxpayers that pays for what we choose to do, and the taxpayers that we make promises to. And we made promises to taxpayers in North Richmond that we were going to build a new community. And as a representative of the citizens of that district, I have an obligation and a responsibility to at least continue to push to be faithful to that promise. Um, so, as we go through this process, it is extremely important that the school board uh, would at least feed back to us two things. I would like, I have some ideas, but I would think that it's important that we begin to name schools soon as to which schools we're talking about consolidating, which zoning we're talking about rezoning so that we understand what that is. And also that we have some sense of when the board is going to adopt an option so that we know that there's a commitment to whichever option that is before the board, and we know what is, would be expected of us that would come online uh, for our community. So there's two questions. One is understanding what is behind the numbers of which schools are going to be closed, consolidated, um, and also, when the board plans to make a decision on the options that are before them. Thank you. Okay, thank you uh, very much. Uh, Madam President, no need to uh, transition at this time. Um, and actually, Councilwoman Robertson, that was a, actually a good segue when you were talking about uh, the academics and all of how that fits together. And so at this point, we wanted to um, have Mr. Westbay come so that you all can know exactly where we are at this point with the 2015-16 budget and uh, the different things where that's affecting and will affect uh, on uh, academic improvement plan. So the challenge we have this evening is that uh, it was requested that we end by 2.30 uh, today. And so, I have Mr. West Bay do his presentation. We'll probably have some time for a few questions. But um, one of the things that we also look at the agenda we had is we recognize that this is an initial meeting. And I'm, I'm trying to get some consensus from you all. Do we feel like we need to have another meeting? continue these types of meetings. I feel like some good feedback has come out of this. And so um, that would be the plan. So we don't need to feel like we're answering everything today, um, but we've heard your questions. We promise there will be follow-up. Uh, but this point here is very critical 
as we look at 2015, 16, and where we are budget-wise. Mr. Westman. Thank you, Mr. Coleman. School board members, council members, Mr. Kranz and I agree on almost everything, but I would like to depart on one point. He said that a blank check really wouldn't help, but Sure now if that's possible. Right. So anyway, uh, this is an update of our major initiative sheet and it's showing you that uh, we started off with our changes in our revenue. We dropped our reliance on fund balance by 2.3 million. Uh, the city transfer for the truancy program was an amendment to this year's budget. So from adopted to adopted, that's new money, the million five forty one. The state revenues and state sales tax combined, we had a decrease of $192,000 and, and we had some tuition and other local fees, a reduction of $159,000. That gave us a starting point of a million one down in our revenue. And then the mayor, in addition to the trans, truancy transfer, $1,541,000, he put another $638,000 in his recommended budget. And then the council added the $9 million and Appreciate the creativity of the staff. I uh, you know it was not an easy job to find those funds. Um, we also, based on our March 31, we've made some other adjustments based on information that has become available since the budget was presented in March 3rd, submitted. Uh, March 31 ADM, we had based next year's enrollment on a level enrollment from a revenue perspective. We have to plan on enrollment from an accommodation standpoint in September 30 how many kids we think are going to arrive and we have to accommodate. But the number that actually remains, which is a seven month average through March 31, is the number we get paid on by the state. So and that number is usually 98% of the September 30th enrollment. So being conservative with that, we still believe we can increase it by 190 students then based on our enrollment projection and what we actually had March 31. Uh, so that's an increase of 872,000 in state revenue. We do have to reduce 489,000 in state revenue for an early reading math initiative program that was available that won't be, we're not gonna be able to take advantage of the next year. So we have revenues built in for that. We reduced the expenditures by a million and the revenues by 489,000. So we've got a net increase in um, revenue overall of 8.919 million, uh, $271 million budget. Then we work down through, um, let's see if this is going to okay, scroll this down. I'm just going to scroll down. So then we made our uh, revenue reductions of 5.7 million. It was in there when we submitted the budget March 3rd. And then since then, we've closed the all card into Thompson, and that's going to save us $701,000 between staff. There's another $115,000 in utilities, so it's an $816,000 savings overall. So we're throwing that into the resources. We're in the midst of doing secondary leveling right now with our fall schedule preparation of our master student schedules and staffing at the secondary level. We thought we might have some additional resources to reallocate and apply to our needs for next year, but it's not looking right now like we're going to have anything substantial to apply to it. The, the number of staff we have or what we need based on the schedules that have been built for the students so far at the middle and, and in the high school levels for next year. Um, and so then that gives us $15,390,000 total resources to apply to the new expenditures for next year. The first one being the truancy transition. The million five forty one plus the additional we needed to round out the program for year two at a million eight forty eight. Then we got a health insurance increase six point eight percent. We're estimating at a million six. Our utility increases next year five hundred sixty one. We have tweaked these numbers by six point four million dollars since we presented this to you. So we reduced the utilities by the hundred fifteen thousand we just mentioned for closing out part, for example. Um, and then maintain current service levels and mandates for workers' comp type programs, um, the Maggie Walker Governor School tuition, closing the warehouse, driver's ed, those things haven't changed, the technical correction, security enhancements. We are going to probably be able to reallocate one position there again from closing Elkhart. We can take one of our security officers. We had two additional security officers in the budget for that $141,000. We're going to 
be able to cover one of those with a transfer from the closing of Elkhart and combining with Thompson. That will be another efficiency we gain out of that. Uh, exceptional debt improvements, we're gonna, we, we've reduced that by 224000 again from retirements that have occurred since we presented the budget. We're going to cover those with an in-house transfer uh, reallocation of positions. So uh, teacher, one teaching position and the director of uh, exceptional education. So uh, that's been reduced to $2.6 The bilingual initiative is $1,300,000. Um, we'll have another $108,000 roughly we can reduce there. Um, K-3 class size is still at a million two. Technology division support initiatives, we dropped that because we're going to be able to use some additional funding from um, other sources like um, BPSA technology funds or E-rate funds to cover a portion of the initiatives that we had there. Um, and then, uh, you can go down. I'll back up a little bit. Yep. Okay. Then, um, K through classes and technology support. Again, some additional funding there. The Benford Fine Arts model we were able, that was a million one. We reduced that down because again we're gonna fund, we've got some money we're gonna be able to use from school improvement grant monies where the state granted us a little additional leniency and allowed us to apply some of those funds to this initiative part. So that brings us down to a running total bottom line, it gets us through the green that we originally presented, which we consider basically the essentials, things that we don't have much choice in doing their, their bills that we're going to receive or things we have to pay if we're operating next year. Um, and so that gets us to $346,000 to apply toward Benford, which puts us at $249,000. Um, we've got some, the board is committed to doing Benford, but they're still meeting tonight to deliberate on the budget, so a final decision on this budget won't be made and on this list until tonight by the board. Um, but we've got some other um, resources we can reallocate. We'll cover that 249,000 potentially if the board agrees with those recommendations. But that is we're going to pretty much where we leave off from the administrative standpoint anyway. That uh, it would take us another. We reduced the, the AIP days from five days to three days, and the reason we did that is because the three days of professional development. Uh, the state gave us a million dollars on the revenue side, that's in our revenue, for the one and a half percent increase. Well, the state will let us count those three additional professional work days as, which is a 1.57 percent increase in pay. They're working an extra three days, but it's also within their 200 day contract. So the state says you can count that for the one and a half percent. But then we have to give 1.5 percent to all the other non teaching staff who are standards of quality positions qualify up again for that million dollars. That costs nine hundred and eighty three thousand dollars, which is line nineteen. And so to give the one and a half percent and capture the three professional development days as part of the academic improvement plan, we'd have to have another four point nine million dollars to implement that in total then. And if we were to give up and stop at just the three professional development days, that says we'd need a million seven but we'd also have to forego the state's $1 million because we wouldn't be satisfying their requirements of giving 1.5% of that 983000 on the bottom there that would be required for that. So in effect, we'd have to have $2.7 million. We'd have to have local money to replace the state's $1 million if all we did was the three additional professional development days, that component of the academic improvement plan. And then everything else down below is below that line. That if we deferred those amounts, we're showing you what the total is. We go clear to the bottom, you'll see that the current gap where it was 24 million at this point is at 7.7 million with everything on that list. So that's briefly where we are at this point. Any questions that you have? Yes, sir. Uh,
appropriate more money to the school system. Madam President, if, if, if you might, or the council, just sort of give us some context about what you all, were you all thinking that whatever additional money you gave would be, we would pay for the first 15 or 20 things, however many, or was it really here's um, a pot of money and you guys make the decision? I just want to clarify because there, Well, everybody's thinking of the right answer. I'll give you my answer. Because that is, was not something that we discussed, but my understanding is what well, we give you money. We can't tell you where to spend it. You figure out where you're going to spend it. My understanding is we are, I want, I'm allowed to say you use this money for this. Right. I, I, I was just so trying to clarify that we, I don't say, we didn't make any assertions that if you give us nine million, we'll take the first nine million on this list and pay for it, or if you give us three million. Because I think from and we'll have this discussion later from, from my perspective, if that if it is just spending as you see wisely, like there are a couple things that I really think uh, Well, um, and, and once again, we can't tell you how to spend it. However, I do believe that many of us have, and they can correct me if I'm wrong. Look at the green on the paper, and and that was what we were under the impression that those were some of the things that were necessities, um, and kind of went through a list uh, on what the important things were, and from there, money was given, and hoping that you would, from there, utilize on this position. I think it's one of those of um, support. I think it's also one of those of representation, uh, and I think that's what you're asking. Is um, when we got the, the presentation, it was ranked, and it was identified that these were the school board's rankings that were supported by the, school, the superintendent and the administration, and uh, that you would have to fund one to get to number two. And you would, we could not cherry pick, and like Ms. Graziano said, we're not going to be able to earmark any of the funds for any of your projects. However, it was represented as the further you get down the list, you would have to fund everything above it in order to get to that line item. And I, I think representation, um, as, as we talk about building a more collaborative relationship, I think how things are represented is very important. Because if it's represented one way, and then perhaps the, the discussion changes after uh, decisions get made, I think that that creates a little bit of one of the situations that you may be alluding to with your question. Sure, and and uh, we'll, we will certainly flesh this out tonight, but um, uh, I'm going to make the argument 